You're traveling through the unknown, a journey beyond the corners of reality, where the shadows whisper and the chill runs deep. Welcome to the dimension where your deepest fears are given form. This is the Midnight Mystery. Addiction took our mother slowly, rocked her through it, and sung her to sleep sunk deep into the mattress on her bed. When her back teeth fell out, she left them on the side of the bathtub. I was seven, and I kept them in a matchbox, the missing pieces of her kept safe, so she wouldn't be lost forever. So maybe one day we could put her back together. Our house fell down around us, and we tried our best to raise ourselves. The ceilings had water damage, and the bottom stairs had dry rot, and in the winters, the radiators would bleed rust. But it was still our house, and Annie made it a home. My sister Annie mothered me, with lopsided band-aids on bruised knees and lukewarm microwave meals. She told me ghost stories, and didn't mind when I crawled into her bed later on. Too scared to sleep alone. She taught me to dance, barefoot on the living room carpet, music channel on full volume on the TV shaking our hips before they were fully grown. She always let me shower first, so the water was hot, never complaining when she had to make do with cold. She brushed my hair every day before school, even when I screamed and hit her when she caught the tangles. Annie was dark-haired like her father, whoever he had been, but I was blonde. Annie was desperate to be blonde too, like Marilyn Monroe, like mom. I think she thought it would make them closer, remind mom less of her dad. I'd give anything for her to have her hands in my hair one more time, even if it hurt. She moved to New York when I turned 18 and never came back. I still dream about her sometimes. Keeping up with our mother was impossible, and we learnt from a young age we would always be left behind. It didn't make it any easier. When she was drinking light, she shone, would wake us up at 3 a.m. with pancakes, dripping in cherry syrup. Sometimes when the weather was right, and she'd had enough being drunk alone, she would call our school up and tell them we had both come down with summer sickness, and we'd drive to the beach instead. I remember being nine years old in the back seat of the car coming home after one of our ocean days, sucking the salt from my fingers. Annie had just dyed her hair blonde, her best friend Jane helping her bend over our kitchen sink. From behind, I couldn't tell who was mother and who was daughter, radio up and windows down blowing the sky inside. When she was drinking heavy, she'd be out all night, hair piled up like a beauty queen, eyes glazed over and ringed with glitter and black. Sometimes. She'd be gone a day or two. She would never tell us when. One day we'd just wake up to an empty house and the fridge packed full. Post-it note on the front with a smear of mom's lipstick in the outline of a kiss, telling us she'd be back soon. Sometimes she'd bring guys home, filling the table with beer cans and ashtrays, smoke up to the ceiling. Mom lost in the haze. We'd sleep with pillows over our heads, trying to drown out the music they would blast until the a.m., and wake up to strangers at our kitchen table in the morning, asking us where we kept the coffee. When mom drank too little, she fell apart. She wouldn't buy food, refrigerator a gaping hole in the wall. She'd chain smoke, leaving cigarette burns on the wallpaper up by the stairs like the walls were sick and decaying. She barely slept, walking around with blue half-moons under her eyes, knuckles raw. She would scream at the slightest thing, I remember once when I spilled a glass of juice on the couch. She looked over at me with dead eyes and dragged me off onto the carpet and then took every single cushion off the couch and into the backyard and set them on fire. Annie went to watch a while from the window and then sat next to me on the floor, backs pressed against the skeleton of the seats, head resting in the crater of my collarbones. When mom drank too much was the worst. She'd laugh too loud and too long at anything and everything until her mouth started to shake and she started crying at the breakfast table into her cereal. Annie shut down when mom was like this, went somewhere deep inside herself where nobody could hurt her. She'd stay up until the morning watching old black and white movies on TV, whispering the lines she knew by heart like prayers. When I was five, I'd cry when I'd find mom passed out cold on her bed, sure she would never wake up. Annie would wipe my tears tell me she was only sleeping just like the princesses in my storybook. We'd sit on mom's bed together and wait for her to wake up, 
When we were older, I was the one who would pick mom up off the bathroom floor again and again, and Annie would put her to bed, smoothing her hair off her face and the vomit from her mouth, changing her clothes if she'd pissed herself. Watching them then, there was no doubt that Annie was the mother now. It was October, and I was 13. Annie, 16. It was a Wednesday night, and Mom had been gone for two days. She'd called us that morning from a payphone, voice slurring down the line, telling us she was having the best time with all her new friends, hoped we were doing fine. When she asked me if I was having a good birthday, I hung up on her. My birthday had been the day before. Annie had given me a pile of presents, strawberry lip glosses, and glittery nail polishes. I didn't ask where she'd got the money for them. I didn't care. We'd taken the bus to the beach with Jane, eaten the birthday cake she had made for me, sand getting into the frosting. It tasted like sweetness in the sea, and I savored every bite and scrape of sugar against my teeth. We watched the sun go down, Annie snapping grainy photos on her shitty Nokia as I blew out my candles, wishing over and over that mom wouldn't come home, that she'd just stay gone this time. But that Wednesday night, me and Annie weren't speaking. Anger hung heavy between us, seeping through the floorboards. It began when she tripped at the bottom of the stairs. We'd both laughed, Annie throwing her head back, gap between her front teeth catching the light. When I'd bent to pick her up, I'd caught her breath, warm against the freckles on my cheeks. I let go of her arms, and she fell again, hitting the floor and grinning, shaking her hair from her face. Her breath was heavy with whiskey. I couldn't start picking her up too, couldn't watch her fall again and again. Just like mom, I knew she'd never get back up. I'd stare down at her, blonde hair fallen into her eyes, and all I could see was our mother. And then I was running, feet slamming the hallway like heartbeats turned loose. I'd run for the kitchen and tipped every bottle we had down the sink, shoving Annie back as she fought to stop me, catching liquor on her fingers as it fell. She grabbed my shoulders and made me drop the very last bottle. It smashed between us on the floor, glass shards shining like we dragged the stars out of the sky and broken them, pieces we could never put back. Outside through the open windows, the sky turned pale gold, clouds a mess of pink and cream smeared across the horizon. I cried then, watching Annie on her knees picking up the pieces. That was Annie, always trying to fix things even when it was too late. The smell of food dragged me from my room, stomach turning traitor inside my ribcage. Annie was cooking pasta, real food not made in a microwave. She'd set the table, Tammy Wynette singing softly from the CD player, Annie gently swaying her hips as she stirred the tomato sauce, rich and warm. As we ate in silence with every bite, I forgave her. Mom never cooked dinner, or remembered my favorite was spaghetti ever since I was a kid, or stayed sober long enough to sit up at a table. Annie wasn't Mom. We were washing the dishes when we first heard it. A moth was crawling down the inside of the pane, and I cracked the window to let it out into the dark. From the backyard came a faint sound. I tilted my head to listen as it was coming from far off, crying. I figured it was Mika, the two-year-old next door, having a tantrum loud enough for us to catch, or maybe even Lucky Strike the cat that junkies down the street, begging for food like he sometimes did. I always wanted to feed him when he came around, winding over my ankles. But Annie always stopped me, saying once you started giving, they never stopped taking. Looking back, I don't think she was talking about the cat. Annie flipped the Christmas lights strung up around the porch, and we sat on the plastic beach chairs watching the skies. When we were little, we'd sit outside, and Annie would tell me the names of all the constellations and the stories of how they came to be hung up in the night sky. I had to grow up before I realized she made them all up as she went along. It was a game we still like to play now, making up ridiculous stories for the shapes we could pick out. Ah, yes. That one there is the Coors Light. It got there when God dropped it out of his convertible window and never picked it up, she said, nodding sagely and hiding her smile. Of course, I said, waving my hands and pointing up past the power lines. Right next to the ashtray left there by angels on a smoke break. Yeah, they say if you wish on it, all your dreams will come true. 
said Annie, grinning. She stopped laughing, voice quieter, face tilted up to all those dead stars. Let's wish Emmy, let's wish. So we did. The sound of crying interrupted us. It was closer this time, and definitely human. We turned to each other, confused. Annie shrugged, and I squinted out into the black. It sounded like a baby, lost and tired and alone. It must be Mika? I said, slowly getting to my feet. Maybe he walked around the back? Shit, do you want to call Connie and tell her we'll bring him over? Annie didn't reply, and I sighed, rolling my eyes. Guess I'll do everything then. I stepped off the porch, grass soft against my heels. The air smelled like it might rain, fresh and clean and growing. A promise unfulfilled. M. Annie's voice was strained. I turned to her, smiling. It died on my face when I saw the look on her own. M, get inside now. She was staring out into the dark, past me, opening the door with one hand behind her, fingers fumbling on the catch. I froze, barefoot in the dirt. I'd found what she was looking at. In the bushes by the back fence was a person, crouched with their knees tucked up neat under the chin, arms wrapped around legs. Their mouth hung wide, softly opening and closing as he cried. Like a child, lost in the dark. Not like a child, but a someone pretending, mimicking the sound, open and closed out in the blackness. Suddenly they straightened, snapping upright face still hidden by the black. They were tall and thin, too thin to be a normal person. Panic made me move, animal instincts left over from the days we lived up in the trees carrying me forward. I was faster than Annie, dragging her inside and slamming the door behind us, hearing it bounce on its hinges as I locked it. We watched as the person slowly walked towards the house, steps deliberate and long. Annie reached for my hand, holding me tight, and turned me to face her, holding my shoulders. Don't turn around, Emmy. Don't turn around. Instinctively, I started to look over my shoulder out into the darkness. Annie grabbed my face hard and shook her head. I knew then she was serious. I'm... Her voice cracked, and she cleared her throat, gripping my hand tight enough to hurt, nails digging in, grounding herself. I looked down at our fingers interlocked, both of us grown from the same bones. I'm gonna call the cops and everything is going to be... Her voice faltered, stuttering. Tears spilled over her lashes, dripping like the promise of rain. Annie never cried. Your phone's on the porch, she whispered, and bile crawled its way up my throat. Her phone was upstairs, charging. A soft tap-tap-tapping filled the silence. Annie turned to the window, eye whites showing her eyes were so wide. It was the sound of someone's forehead against the glass, slowly, over and over. They started to speed up, faster and harder, skin meeting glass until they was slamming into the window hard enough to shake the panes. The tapping stopped, and I was about to ask Annie if I could look now when she screamed, followed by the sound of cracking glass and the loudest slam yet. Whoever was in our yard had just smashed their face hard enough into the window to break it. We ran upstairs, two at a time, skipping the ones caved in with dry rot on instinct. I turned behind me once, and Annie yanked my face back before I could see. The sound of broken glass echoed behind us as we made it to the bathroom, locking the door. A thin, wailing cry, like a baby calling for its mother, filled the hallway, trapped between the walls and locked doors. Annie threw her back against the door, feet jammed up against the bathtub, clutching the knife she had grabbed from the kitchen. I did the same, shoulder to shoulder. Slow footsteps started on the stairs, deliberate and casual. The crying had become mocking, almost laughter, shrill bursts of sound and then giggles, high-pitched and abruptly stopping before starting again. The first door on the upstairs floor was my bedroom, and we heard the distinct sound of it slamming open. They were looking for us. What the fuck is going on? I asked Annie, not even bothering to brush away the tears that I couldn't stop falling. I watched my sister pick herself up off the floor and brace her hands on the door as we heard the sound of a second door slamming open. Mom's room. The next room on the hallway was the bathroom. Annie pulled me to my feet and handed me the knife. I shook my head and pushed it back to her, 
terrified of what would happen if I had to use it. Annie shoved me and pressed the knife into my hands, thumb pressing hard enough on the blade to bleed. I watched my sister's blood drip down her wrist, a winding red road, still pushing into my hands despite the pain. I took the knife. Something slammed against the wall that mom's room shared with the bathroom. A high-pitched wail followed. I held my breath, could feel my heartbeat in the base of my throat, a wild and frantic thing. I'm gonna get the phone from my room. I shook my head violently about to argue. Annie clamped a hand over my mouth. I could taste the blood on her hand, salty and sweet, like birthday cake by the ocean. Yes, I'm gonna get the phone and I'm gonna call the cops, and we're going to be okay. I shook my head again. It's the only way. When I go, I need you to lock the door and you don't open it for anything or anyone. Not for me, not for anyone. Promise me. I shook my head and Annie pressed her hand into my mouth, crushing my teeth against my lips so it made my eyes water. Yes. Promise me, M. Something smashed in the room next door. Annie brushed the hair off my face, gently tucking it behind my ear. Promise. She mouthed and unlocked the door as slowly as possible, bolt scraping gently. I watched the curve of her shoulder disappear into the black hall outside, like the moon in eclipse, and then she was gone. I couldn't move or breathe for a second, and then I slammed the bolt shut just as something bounced off the outside of the door. A high-pitched scream followed, handle rattling up and down hard enough to pop one of the screws. I watched it roll towards me on the tiles, and then silence. I sat with my back to the door, holding the knife and wishing I was holding Annie's hand instead. Still silence. Nothing but me and my lungs slowly filling the room with my breath. M? Came a voice through the door. I started, hands gripping the knife. Honey, what's going on? Mom? My voice cracked. Mama, is that you? I wrapped my arms around myself, shaking, trying to keep myself still. Sweetie, it's okay, just open the door. It's okay, just let me in. The handle rattled again, gentler. Just let me in, it's all okay. She banged on the door and I took my handle of the bolt. Honey, I'm sorry, I'm sorry I missed your birthday. I'm sorry I'm such a terrible mother, please. Her voice broke and she started to cry. Just let me in, baby, I'm so sorry. I screwed my eyes shut. She sounded so sad and so lost. I just wanted her to hold me like when I was a kid, and I'd come in off the swings with a scraped knee. Maybe this time she meant it, maybe it would all be okay. My hand found its way to the bolt again. My sister's voice came through the door, warm and gentle. Yeah, Emily, let us in, it's all okay. My hand froze on the bolt, and I tightened my grip on the knife. Annie never called me by my full name. A hand banged on the door, handle rattling. Emily let us in. Annie's voice became low and guttural, followed by the same shrill giggles from before. Mom spoke now, pleading and crying, voice getting louder and louder. Let us in. Let us in, let us in. Over and over again, punctuated by her fists on the door. I thought about demons and monsters, all the bedtime stories we pray don't crawl out from under the bed. That's not my sister, and you're not my mother. I screamed through the door, hands over my head. I climbed into the bathtub and curled in a ball, cradling myself, knife clutched to my chest. I didn't know what it was outside that door, but I knew it wasn't Annie. It wasn't the voice that yelled at when I changed TV channel, the one that sang me happy birthday, the one that told me I was smart even when I got bad grades, the one that read me stories about princesses that never wake up. It wasn't human. Bangs and yells came from downstairs, followed by the footsteps of people running. A low, guttural howl ripped through the house, filling the room until I felt like I was drowning in the sound, and then the door was kicked in. I screamed, covering my eyes, waiting to die. Arms found me and lifted me from the tub, carrying me from the room. I looked at the outside of the door as I was carried downstairs. It was covered in long, scraping claw marks, dragged down to the floor. Pillows ripped apart covered the hallway in soft down, like it had snowed inside. I watched them drift slowly as men in uniforms checked each of the rooms that looked like they had been torn apart by something feral. 
Outside in our driveway were police cars and an ambulance. In the middle of it all was Annie, bathed in blue and red light as it washed over her, lit up in the dark like a neon angel, face aglow. I threw myself from the cop's shoulder and ran to her, holding us both together, broken pieces and all, standing under all those constellations we made up. Gentle screaming came from the ambulance which rocked occasionally. Annie gently turned my head away, smiling so sadly it made my chest ache as I understood. Turns out there was no demon, no wild animal or bad men trying to break in. Just mom, out of her mind on booze and drugs and everything in between, coming to the end of a week-long binge. Something had finally broken inside her head, and this time, we couldn't put her back together no matter how hard we tried. Sometimes you fall one last time, and you never get back up. Annie had seen her in the garden, blood dribbling from her mouth, track marks bulging on her forearms like unmapped roads, rail thin and desperate for one more hit, one more fix. She'd searched the kitchen for all the drink I'd thrown away, and when she hadn't found it, had come to hunt for the stash she hid in the bathroom. She hadn't wanted me, just the drugs on the other side of the door, so high she could mimic Annie's voice almost perfectly. Turns out the real monsters are the ones that eat you alive slowly, the kind that come in a bottle or a needle or at the end of a long list of reasons why you can't get out of bed in the morning. Sometimes the monsters are the ones that raise you or love you the most, but it's up to you if you let them in. My first memory of sleep paralysis happened when I was 10 years old. I remember because it was the night my parents took me to see Shrek 2 for getting good marks on my report card. It was an evening show, so we got in late, and my mom tucked me straight into bed when we got home. It was around 4 a.m. when I woke up. The light from my alarm clock told me that much. I couldn't feel anything. Not my pajamas against my skin, or the warmth of my head against the pillow. I could feel my arms and legs, but they felt heavy, as if a great weight was holding them down. I tried to call out, but I couldn't. My voice caught in my throat, my lips unable to move. I mustered a weak groan that sounded like a cross between a frog's croak and a zombie's moan, but that was it. I thought I was dead, that this is what death feels like, being awake but unable to move or tell anyone. My mind wrestled with the idea of being placed in a coffin, unable to tell anyone I was still alive in here, unable to move or say anything as the lid closed, and they put me in the ground, still alive. My fear subsided as I felt my heart thudding in my chest in response to my near panic attack. I also became aware of my breathing, which slowed as the fear subsided. I calmed a little, thinking it was just a dream. That was when I saw him for the first time. Mr. Brown Stick Legs. He huddled in the corner of the room by my closet. His two oversized red eyes glowed in the dark of my bedroom. His face was like a porcelain mask, white, expressionless, with no mouth or nose, only those two haunting red eyes. When he stood up, his body unfolded like origami until his head reached the ceiling. His neck bent tilting forward as his true height was greater than the height of my room. His long, black torso was covered in shimmering symbols that reflected red in the light of his glowing eyes. He stood on two spindly thin legs that disappeared into the shadows of the room. He made no noise as he moved, seeming to glide as he hovered closer to my bed. His long, thin arms reached down to me as I moaned through paralyzed lips. I could not scream, even though I very much wanted to his fingers reaching through the darkness, down to my face. Two pointed fingers touched against my eyelids, pushing them closed. I remember his fingertips feeling cool, but not cold. Even though the ends of his fingertips looked sharp, his touch was gentle. Do not struggle, little one. Sleep, sleep, he said. His voice was so deep I could feel it in my chest when he spoke. I did as instructed, convincing myself that it indeed was a dream. Even if it wasn't, the back of my eyelids was more reassuring than looking into those piercing red eyes and his vacant mask of a face. I closed my eyes, wanting it to be a dream, willing it to be a dream. I woke up the next morning, thankfully able to move, walk, and talk. I explained what I saw to my parents, 
who both agreed that it was a dream. My mom tried floating the idea that something from Shrek 2 scared me, but neither my dad or I bought it. For confirmation, dad asked that I draw a picture of what I saw for them. As I was drawing, I ran out of black crayon and had to finish his legs with the next darkest color in my crayon box. Hey there, Mr. Brown Stick Legs, my dad said as I handed him the drawing. You leave my daughter alone now, you hear? This is how my sleep paralysis demon ended up with the name Mr. Brown Stick Legs. Giving him a silly name helped take some of the edge off of going to bed the following night. My dad even did a sweep of the room, calling out for him. Here, Mr. Brown Stick Legs, he said, whistling as if he were calling a dog. It made me giggle, and the whole episode felt more fun than scary. But once they tucked me in and turned off the light, I felt the dread creeping back in. Darkness hits harder when you expect to find something lurking in the shadows. I don't know how long I searched, but I eventually fell asleep. In the weeks following, I searched for Mr. Brownstick legs every night as I fell asleep. Even when I went to sleepovers, I would do a cursory check in case he tagged along to a friend's house. As time passed, my searches became less frequent. It was a couple months later, the night before my first day of fifth grade, when I woke up to Mr. Brownstick legs straddled over my bed, his empty plate of a face inches from my own. A scream stuck in my throat, coming out sounding like a gush of air releasing from a pool float. Hush, child, he said. His voice was deep, echoless. I didn't know how he spoke without a mouth, but I heard him nonetheless. I saw that he held a piece of paper in his thin fingers, crumpled on the edges and torn. He held it up to show me. On the page was a pink blob with blue dots for eyes and a droll red smile and stick lines for legs and arms. It was lying on a blue rectangle. I found the picture you drew of me, so I drew a picture of you, he said. Do you like it? I tried nodding, but I couldn't move. I tried answering, but all that came out was the same dry, croaking sound. Will you draw another one for me? I so liked the first one you gave me pants. I look good in pants. Again, I was unable to respond or move to give him an answer. He must have been able to read my intent, because he tucked the picture under my pillow before closing my eyes again. When I woke up in the morning, I bolted upright and tossed my pillow off the bed. My heart leapt into my throat when I found the picture. It wasn't a dream. He was real. I went to my desk and began drawing a picture for him, starting with his face and eyes, trying to capture as much detail as I could remember. I had forgotten all about the first day of school until my mom opened my door and found me still in my pajamas. Lexi, she yelled, startling me as I was coloring in his eyes. Your bus will be here in less than an hour. Get dressed now. I tucked my picture into my school backpack and got dressed. I finished my drawing at recess that day, using my brand new Crayola 64 pack that I got with my back to school supplies. I gave him blue pants this time figuring he'd like to see himself in jeans. I wrote his name, Mr. Brown Stick Legs, at the bottom of the picture, and drew a smiley face next to it, hoping he'd like his nickname. I flipped the paper over to write him a message on the back. I wanted to ask him questions, but didn't want to anger him since he visited me when I was at my most vulnerable. I wrote out my letter on a separate piece of paper before copying it over to the back of my picture. Dear Mr. Brown Stick Legs, that's your name. My name is Lexi. I am in the fifth grade. What is your name? How old are you? Do you go to school? Why do you visit my bedroom? Why can't I move when you visit? You look scary, but you also seem nice. I hope we can be friends. Love, Lexi P.S. I hope you like your blue pants. I added another smiley face at the end of the letter, my final emphasis on wanting to be friends. I considered closing with sincerely, but I figured love was a better, friendlier choice. I tucked the picture under my pillow that night, now anxious to see him, rather than filled with dread of his reappearance. But like the last time, he did not return the next day, or the day after. The days stretched into weeks, and every morning I found the picture tucked under my pillow from the night before. It wasn't until Thanksgiving break that I saw him again. My eyes opened as the morning sun poked through the blinds of my bedroom. 
His body didn't look any different in the light. In fact, his black skin seemed darker, absorbing the sun's rays without giving anything back. His eyes seemed wider than before. If he had a mouth, I would have figured he was smiling. In his slender fingers was the picture I drew for him. Hello, Lexi, he said. Thank you for the picture. I do look good in blue pants. I wanted to smile, but, well, sleep paralysis. He flipped the picture over to the side with my letter. I will answer your questions the best I can. I do not have a name, not one you could ever pronounce, but I am happy for you to call me Mr. Brownstick Legs. As for my age, I exist outside of the construct of time. Therefore, I am ageless. I do not go to school, nor do I know what school is. Why do I visit you? I visit to feed on the energy of your soul. My breath quickened as a mute groan exited my teeth. I wanted to run, wanted to get away from him, but I was pinned down, unable to move. He sensed my uneasiness and tried to calm me by patting my forehead. Let me explain. Have you been to the ocean? It appears vast, almost limitless as you stare out into the blue water with no visible land on the other side. In my mind, I was standing on a beach. I felt the salty ocean breeze against my face as I looked out over the massive body of water. The waves crashed at my feet. I felt the rush of water over them, followed by the trickle of sand and pebbles as the water drew back. Your soul is like an ocean, child. Vast, limitless, undefinable by words to your understanding. I take only a tiny sip, a single glass of water from a vast ocean. I am not one who could consume an entire ocean. Dark clouds formed over the water as I stared at the white-capped waves. The clouds unleashed a heavy downpour, turning the horizon gray as rain fell from the sky over the ocean. Just as the rain falls over the ocean, your soul can replenish itself by more than I could ever consume, not even in a thousand of your years. Does that make you feel better? On the beach in my mind's vision, I nodded. In my bedroom, he nodded back at me. Good. As for your last question, why you cannot move, we are meeting at a point outside of your time, where your world and mind touch. Your physical body cannot move here, but if you persist, you can learn to speak to me with your mind, and I will answer your questions in exchange for your drawings. You can draw pictures of whatever you like. I want to know more of your world. In my mind, I nodded again. This knowledge is a gift, so we can understand one another more. I am not one who would hurt you. He pressed his fingertips to my eyelids again, closing them. In my mind's eye, I was still on the beach, but the sun was setting, and no stars were visible through the rain. I drifted back to sleep to the sound of falling rain. The next morning I asked my parents for a sketchbook and colored pencils. They tried to hold me off until Christmas, but since I spent most of my afternoons and weekends drawing pictures up in my room. Dad let me open one of my gifts a week early, a Strathmore sketchbook with a hundred pages, with a fifty-pack of Crayola-colored pencils. I started by drawing the rest of my family, Mom, Dad, my little brother Tommy, our cat Libby, and even though he had died, our dog Pancakes. Next I drew our house, then our car, then my school. I kept drawing anything I could think of, trees, birds, insects, until my sketchbook was full. I used my allowance to purchase more books so I could keep drawing. I honed my craft, redoing my earlier drawings in greater detail. My thoughts considered his wording, I am not one who could consume an entire ocean. I wanted to ask him if there were those who could, but I wasn't sure if I wanted to know such things. Mr. Brownstick Legs didn't return until my freshman year of high school. To him, it wasn't like any time had passed. I read up on lucid dreaming in the time between visits so that when he returned, I would be better capable of talking to him. He held my book in his hands, flipping through my drawings, doting over the increased refinement of my drawing skills. I had filled a dozen sketch pads and upgraded from Crayola to Prismacolor Premier pencils for my drawings. His biggest surprise was when after he complimented my drawings, I spoke to him. Thank you, I said, seeing the words in my mind as I spoke them aloud. If he had a surprised expression, his eyes showed it. You have been very busy, child, he said. Do you have any questions you would like to ask? I hesitated, but finally formed the words in my mind. 
Are there creatures who can consume an entire ocean? He didn't respond right away, which made me think I had not asked properly. As I asked him a second time, he put a finger to my lips as if to shush me. There are those who can. They are known as the Dark Ones. They are capable of consuming entire souls, emptying them out, leaving them dry and barren. You should not fear them, but you should also not provoke them. His eyes curved downward, as if concerned or afraid. What do they look like? I asked. In my mind, my visions were filled with images of great, terrible creatures. Spiders taller than the Empire State Building, on thin, spindly legs of shadow and smoke. Tentacled monsters in the seas, lofting blue whales like they were toys, ripping them to shreds with their curved, kittenous beaks. Great, ghastly flying creatures that knocked over orchards and forests with the beat of their leathery wings. I showed you only because you ask, Mr. Brownstickleg said, but it is best that we don't talk or think about them. Let them be. I nodded in my mind. He leaned forward and pressed his plate-like face to my head as if to kiss me on the forehead, which was odd since he didn't have a mouth. Then, as usual, he closed my eyes and I drifted back to sleep. My life took a downturn during the latter years of high school. My dad lost his job, and when the search for a new one dragged on, he turned to drinking to cope with his failure. He wasn't abusive, but he wasn't fun to be around either. In the months following, my parents would hush their arguing when I entered the room, greeting me with smiles as if nothing were wrong. That lasted until the day I came home from school to them, fighting over a foreclosure notice from the bank. We moved out over a weekend from our home in the suburbs to an apartment on the other side of town. I internalized my feelings during that time, I withdrew from my friends and school activities besides the art club, the only one we could still afford. I saw my friends driving to school and hanging out while I rode the bus, too poor and too far out of the way to join in. My tastes began to change as well. Out was the bubblegum pop of Katy Perry, K. Dollar Ha, and Taylor Swift. Instead I listened to Pierce the Veil, Sleeping with Sirens, and Bring Me the Horizon. My clothes and makeup became darker more black t-shirts and skirts with black eyeliner and black fingernail polish. Mom called it my goth phase, not that she understood. My drawings became darker too. I moved from colored pencils to charcoal, drawing skulls and gothic looking cemeteries as my passion for drawing animals and flowers waned. I also drew the dark ones in great detail, exactly how I remembered them in my mind's eye. Mr. Brownstick Legs visited me again a month after we moved into the apartment. He looked more at home in my room of black light posters and death metal bands than he did in my previous room. His eyes were dim, not the vibrant red as they were before. He stared at me as I lay in bed, unable to move. He moved inches from my face as I heard his words in my mind. Your soul tastes different now. He didn't speak of my drawings. I worried that he might especially since I had been drawing the dark ones. Not only drawing them, but thinking about them, and what type of damage they could do if they were to wake. He seemed sad for me, although reading his expression was difficult with no face. He patted my forehead like before, but didn't close my eyes before leaving as he used to. My life continued its spiraling path like a bottle rocket with a broken stick. My parents didn't talk outside of short conversations about which bills to pay and which ones to ignore. Each night, Dad disappeared into a bottle, while Mom disappeared online to chat with a male Facebook friend she knew from high school. The thing about rock bottom is that it's often a disguise for a trapdoor that drops you to an even lower depth than you thought possible. The first bottom came when my father died, drove off the road into a gravel pit late at night with an empty bottle of bourbon in the passenger seat. I cried, but it felt hollow. I felt hollow. Even when mom tried to hold me, I felt nothing inside. Not sadness, not guilt, not anything. I disappeared into my sketchbooks, drawing even darker, more disturbing images. Death, dismemberment, vividly accurate vivisections of the cute animals I used to enjoy drawing. My friends no longer talked to me, which was fine because I didn't want to talk to them anymore anyways. I found people to hang out with, not friends, but people who could get me access to moments of chemical-induced euphoria to forget about life for a while. Just like that, the trapdoor opened, 
dropping me to a new rock bottom of addiction. One thing I had that in common with my dad, but instead of falling into a bottle, I fell into a needle. I stole money from my mom's purse to feed my habits, not that she noticed. She was busy with her old Facebook friend who had moved from online acquaintance to nightly sleepover companion. When the time came to begin my senior year, I didn't bother going back. I kept drawing, filling entire sketchbooks with the dark images that reflected my bleak outlook on life. The dark ones were prevalent subjects during this period of my life. I drew them feasting on humanity, raking flesh from bone in their jagged teeth behind lips of smoke. I came home one night to find my mom and her new male friend in the middle of a fight. It was different from her fights with dad, more violent, more physical. When he raised his hand at me for trying to intervene, I decided it was time to bolt. I left home, hitching rides with anyone with a set of wheels I could manage to put up with for short periods of time. My preference leaned toward those with access to the chemical release I craved. The more I could numb, the more I could escape. I found certain drug combinations had similar effects to sleep paralysis, where my mind's ability to control my body's action became severed. In those moments of numbed paralysis, I'd see Mr. Brownstick legs watching from afar as I dulled the pain. I saw what I perceived as the dark ones too, but they weren't hiding in the shadows like Mr. Brownstick legs did. They were the shadows. I called out to them as well. For in those moments, I wanted nothing more than to be hollowed out and empty. A void so dark, no pain could ever penetrate it. When they didn't answer, I called out to Mr. Brownstick Legs, but he would vanish every time. Perhaps it was all just a drug-fueled hallucination. Overdosing was never my intention. I was pushing too much, trying to find the edge of the void after feeling so low, so very low, searching for that something extra to filter out the background noise. I took it too far giving myself a near-lethal dose. At one moment, I was lying next to strangers on a stained mattress in an abandoned warehouse. Then came the initial rush of euphoric bliss. And then, nothing. Whoever I was traveling with at the time dumped me on the curb in front of the ER, making me someone else's problem. This was my rock-bottom moment, although at the time, it felt more like freefall. I spent three weeks in a coma, I was aware of my surroundings and could hear the doctors and nurses as they checked my vitals and tended to my cleanliness and upkeep, but I couldn't move or speak. At the end of my third week in the ICU on an incubator, I looked up to find Mr. Brownstick Legs hovering over me, his round red eyes peering through the darkness. What have you done to yourself, child? His voice spoke inside my mind. In my mind, I was beside him standing in the middle of a vast, salt-flat desert. The ground was cracked and dry in a hexagonal pattern that stretched in all directions. This is your soul now. There is nothing left to drink. I heard my beep of my heart rate monitor back in my hospital room speed up as fear entered my mind. I called out to the Dark Ones, I said. I asked for them to come. They emptied me out, emptied my soul. No, my child. You did this. You have not replenished, you have only consumed, and now, nothing remains. I dropped to my knees in the middle of the salt as I felt a rumbling deep inside the hollow pit of my stomach. I leaned forward onto my arms, but they were no longer my arms. They were pitch black and empty. I could feel them, but when I looked at them, they were empty voids of smoke and shadow. I stood up on my legs, but they were no longer my legs. The darkness swirled up my torso and down my arms. The emptiness inside me consumed my entire body until only my head remained. What's happening to me? I heard a snap as my arms and legs split, forming eight black, spindly, thin legs. I collapsed onto them, unable to support myself. Mr. Brownstick legs glided down in front of my face, his eyes inches from my own. As I told you, child, only the Dark Ones have the ability to consume an entire ocean of a soul. That is your fate. That is what you will become. Back in the room, my heart rate monitor crashed to a flat line. I felt the cold darkness swirl up my neck to my head as the void consumed me. I was aware of the nurses and doctors huddled around my body, prepping the crash cart. 
but all I felt was the cold consuming what was left of me. Help me, I uttered. Please. My physical body jolted from the electric paddles, but I felt nothing. Only the cold darkness, a needle injected into my IV line as they recharged for another burst of electricity. Still I felt nothing. Only cold. Only darkness. Only the vast emptiness of the void. Mr. Brownsticklegs tilted his head as he stared through his unblinking red eyes. He leaned forward, pressing his plate like face to my forehead. I felt a vibration against my skin, followed by the tingling sensation of heat returning. The darkness receded back down my arms and legs. As he pulled back, the red in his eyes had diminished. A gift for the girl who gave me pants. A tear formed in my eye. It rolled down my cheek and fell onto the parched landscape below. Before I could say anything, an electronic jolt coursed through my body, pulling me away from the salt-flat expanse and back to my hospital room. The sinus rhythm of my heart rate monitor returned to normal. I felt the cool gel of the defibrillator paddles against my chest. I remember squeezing the hand of one of the attending nurses, who smiled down at me. Look who's awake. I cried, but it was different than before. I felt the pain I had long been avoiding, but I felt something else as well. I felt grateful, and I felt a sense of hope I hadn't known in a long time. It was a long road back from the darkness, but the thing about the road to recovery is that, like a road, it leads to a destination. After years of listless drifting towards the void, having a destination was an important first step in finding self-love. I reconnected with my mother, who was struggling with her own form of the darkness. We leaned on one another, talking and going to therapy as we worked through the issues that drove us apart. After my release from the hospital, I moved back home with her, her Facebook friend long gone. I got my GED and used my many sketchbooks as a portfolio to get an apprenticeship at a tattoo parlor. I've been clean for four years now, and it feels good to smile again. Granted, I still prefer Pierce the Veil to anything from Katy Perry's catalog, and my tattoos and jewelry have more skulls than fluffy bunnies, but that's all on the surface. I no longer crave the darkness to consume me. I often think about the vision with Mr. Brownstick legs on the salt flats that night in the hospital. I had not seen him since that night, and I often wonder about the state of my soul since that day. Has it replenished, or is it still the dried-up barren wasteland that he took me to on the night? Last night, around three in the morning, I finally got my answer. I woke up with a heaviness on my chest, arms, and legs. At first, I felt the grips of fear grabbing hold, much like the first time I experienced it. But then in the dark corner of my room, I saw glowing red eyes staring back at me from the shadows. In spite of my sleep paralysis, couldn't help but smile when I heard his voice call out to me. Child, your soul tastes much better now. It's official. I'm an old man. For the last couple of years, I've comforted myself by saying I'm in my early 70s, but math is simple and unforgiving. Today is my 75th birthday, and God, the years do fly. I'm not here for your well wishes. This is hardly a milestone I'm excited about. I'm glad to still be here, of course, but I find I have less and less to live for with every passing year. My bones ache, my kids live far away, and the other side of my bed has been empty for just over eight months now. In fact, once I cast my vote against that goddamn Trump this November, I may have nothing to live for at all. So spare me your happy birthdays and your congratulations if you please. I'm here because I have a story for you, and it's one I've never told before. I used to think I kept it inside because it was silly, or maybe because nobody would believe it. I've found, though, that the older you grow, the more exhausting it becomes to lie to yourself. If I'm being perfectly honest, I've never told anybody this story because it scares me, almost to death. But death seems friendlier than it used to, so listen close. The year was 1950 the setting a small town in Maine. I was a boy of nine, rather small for my age, with only one friend in the world to speak of, and his family, seemingly on a whim,
decided to move 2,000 miles away. It was shaping up to be the worst summer of my life. My pop wasn't around, and my mom was a chore whore. Boy, was I proud of myself when I came up with that one. So I wasn't apt to hang around the house. With some hesitation, I decided the public library was the place to be that summer. The library's collection of books, particularly children's books, was meager to say the least. But within the walls of that miserly structure, I would find no undone chores, no nagging mother, God rest her soul. And perhaps most importantly, no other children with whom I would be expected to associate. I was the only kid with a low enough social status to spend his precious days of freedom sulking amid the bookshelves. And that was just fine with me. The first half of my summer was even more dreadful than I had imagined it would be. I would sleep in until 10, do my chores, and then ride my bike to the library. And by bike, I mean rusty log of shit attached to a pair of wheels. Once there, I would split my time between unintentionally annoying the elderly patrons and deliberately doing so. One pleasant lady actually interrupted my incessant tongue clicking to hiss a shut the fuck up at me. The first time I ever heard a grown-up use the F word. Big fucking deal, I know, but in those days, it was unheard of. The dreary days turned to woeful weeks. I had actually begun praying for school to start again, until I discovered the basement. I could have sworn I'd roamed every inch of that library. But one day, in the far corner behind the foreign language collection, I stumbled across a small wooden door I had never seen before. That was where it all began. The door was windowless and made from oak that looked far older than the wall in which it rested. It had a knob of black metal that quite literally looked ancient. I wouldn't have been surprised to learn it was crafted in the 17th century. Engraved on the knob was what appeared to be a single footprint. I had the sense that whatever lay beyond this door was forbidden to me, and therefore probably the most interesting thing I would encounter all summer. I quickly glanced around to make sure nobody was watching me, then turned the heavy knob, slipped behind the door, and shut it. There was nothing. Only darkness. I took a couple of steps and then stopped, unnerved by the totality of the shadow which surrounded me. I waved my hands in front of me in an attempt to find a wall or a shelf or anything to hold on to. What I actually found was far more subtle, a small string dangling from above, but far more useful. I grabbed it firmly and pulled it down. Back in the day, lots of light bulbs were operated with strings, and this was one of them. My surroundings were instantly illuminated. I was standing on a small, dusty platform that looked as though it hadn't seen life in quite some time. To my left was a crickety-ass spiral staircase, made of wood and appearing ready to collapse at any second. The bulb was the only source of light in the room, and it was feeble. So when I peered over the railing to see what lay below, the bottom of the staircase dissolved into the darkness. I was beginning to feel scared. This place, wherever I was, seemed to have no business in a town library. It was as though I were in a completely different building. But no nine-year-old likes to let a mystery go unsolved. Looking back, I wish I could tell my prepubescent self to turn around, go back, do anything else besides descending that staircase. You'll be spared a lot of sleepless nights, I'd say. But of course, I didn't know that then, and I may not have listened even if I had. So instead of turning back, I took a deep breath, gripped the railing, and glared resolutely forward as I began my descent. The wood on the railing was dry and covered with splinters. I immediately let go, holding my hands out for balance as I carefully traversed the staircase. It was, or at least seemed, very long and with only the dim glow from the string bulb far above me, my heart pounded mercilessly in the darkness. Even kids can sense when something isn't right, I think. They just don't always give a shit. By the time my feet reached the cement floor at the bottom, the light from the bulb above was very nearly a memory. But there was a new light source, and God, I'll never forget it. Directly in front of me was a door, massive, and a deep shade of red. The light was coming from behind the door, and it shone out in thin lines from all four sides, a sinister, dimly glowing rectangle. For the second time, I took a deep breath and went through a door I shouldn't have. In contrast to the dank room I entered from, the room behind the door was blinding. 
When my eyes adjusted, what I saw nearly took my breath away. It was a library, the most perfect library imaginable. I gaped in wonder as I stepped almost reverently further into the room. It was beautiful. It was smaller than the library above, much smaller, but it seemed to be almost tailor-made for me. The shelves were packed with brightly colored titles. Both armchairs in the middle of the room were exquisitely comfortable, and the smell, my god, the smell was simply unbelievable. Sort of a mixture of citrus and pine. I simply can't do it justice with words. So I'll suffice it to say that I've never smelled anything better. Not in my 75 years. What was this room? Why had I never heard of it before? Why was nobody else here? Those were the questions I should have been asking. But I was intoxicated. As I gazed around at all the books and basked in the smell of paradise, I could only form one thought. I will never be bored again. In truth, boredom only hid from me for three years. It was on my 12th birthday, 63 years ago to this day, that everything changed. Before that day, I visited my basement sanctuary as often as I could, usually several times a week. I never saw another soul down there, yet strangely remained free of suspicion. I never removed a book from that room, but instead would pick up a particular volume wherever I had stopped reading during my previous visit. I sat, always in the same deep purple armchair, and always leaving its twin barren and directly across from myself. That armchair was mine, the other was. Well, I suppose I couldn't have articulated it then much better than I can now. But it wasn't mine, that's for damn sure. On my twelfth birthday, I arrived later than usual. My mom had invited a couple classmates and some cousins over to our house to celebrate, a gesture which I found more tedious than touching. Really, I just wanted to spend my birthday sitting and reading and smelling paradise. Eventually, our guests went home, and I made it to the library about 15 minutes before closing time. That didn't matter. The workers never checked down there before they locked up. I was free to stay as late as I wished. This particular night, I was devouring the final chapters of an epic adventure. Knights, swords, dragons, and the like. I didn't smell it until I read the final words and closed the book. The once exquisite aroma of that room had turned sour. I sat for a moment, unsettled. Objectively, I could recognize that the smell was actually the same as it had been before, that mixture of citrus and pine. I just perceived it differently, and I didn't like it anymore. It was the nasal version of an optical illusion, you know, the one that looks like a young woman glancing backward, but all of a sudden you see that it's really an old woman facing toward you. You can't unsee that and I couldn't unsmell this. The spell was broken. The odor also seemed for the first time to be coming from somewhere specific. With a fair amount of trepidation, I stalked around the room, sniffing the air like a crazed canine, until I came to a shelf near the back. The shelf was perfectly normal, with the exception of one title, a large leather-bound cover of solid faded maroon with one striking black footprint at the top of the spine. This was the source of the smell, I opened the front cover and saw one sentence scrawled neatly in blood-red ink atop the first page. Rest your sorrows down, friend, and leave them where they lie. I stared at this sentence, mesmerized, as I began to retreat to my chair. I turned a page. Blank. The smell became stronger. Another page. Blank. And the smell grew stronger still. I stopped for a moment, suppressed a gag and continued walking. Then, as I neared the armchairs, I turned one final page, and there, in the same sinister print, was the last thing I expected to see. My own name. I dropped the book. I began to sprint toward the door, but as I shifted my gaze forward, my heart leapt to my throat and I stopped in my tracks. The empty chair wasn't empty anymore. An aged man in a suit sat before me, one leg crossed over the other contemplating me with piercing gray eyes and a light smirk. This was all too much. I fell to my knees and expelled the contents of my stomach onto the carpet. I wiped my mouth, staring at my vomit, when I heard the man let out a chuckle. I stared at him disbelievingly. Who are you? I asked, panic in my voice. The man leapt to his feet, 
grabbed me gently by the shoulders and helped me to my chair. He sat once again in his own. I fear we got off to a bad start, he said, glancing at the pile of sick on the carpet. The smell, it does take some getting used to. Who are you? I repeated. Tonight you will know hardship like you've never before known, he said. I come as a friend, offering you refuge from it and from all other storms which lie ahead. I wanted nothing more than to leave at that moment, but I remained seated. I asked him what he was talking about. Your mother is dead, my boy, by her own hand in her kitchen. The scene is gruesome, I must admit, he said in sorrowful tones. But was there a playful glint in his eye? Surely you wish to avoid this path. I can show you a safer one. My blood ran cold at the horrors this man spoke of, but I did not believe him. What do you want with me? I demanded, trying to sound braver than I felt. He laughed, an old raspy yelp that seemed to shake him to his bones. Nothing but your friendship, dear boy, he said. Then, sensing I found his answer inadequate, he expounded. I want you to come on a journey with me. My work is noble, and you will make a fine apprentice. And maybe when I'm done, he sighed tiredly running his bony fingers through his thin white hair. Maybe then, my work can be yours. I stood up, shuffling toward the door, but never breaking his gaze. You're crazy, I told him. My mom isn't dead, she's not. See for yourself if you must, he said, gesturing toward the door. I threw him a contemptuous glare and bolted for the exit. As my hand closed around the knob, he said my name softly. In spite of myself, I turned around. Your road won't be easy, friend, if it ever becomes too much for you, and I mean ever, he said, pausing to sweep his hand over the room. You know where to find me. I slammed the door behind me and took the decrepit stairs two at a time. I exited the library, clambered onto my bike, and high-tailed it home. The front door was wide open. I dismounted leaving my bike in a heap on the ground, and approached the house cautiously. The old man was lying. He must have been. Still, tears began to sting my eyes. Heart pounding, I stepped inside and called for my mother. I heard no answer, so I turned into the kitchen. To this day, I don't know why she did it. I've lived in that small town in Maine my entire life, although I've kept mostly clear of the public library. Once, in my late twenties, I summoned the courage to step inside. Life was good at that time, and my fear had begun to morph into idle curiosity. Where the door to my basement sanctuary once stood was only a blank wall. I asked the librarian what had become of that basement, though in my heart I knew the answer. There was no basement, she said. There had never been a basement. In fact, if she had her facts correctly, city zoning ordinances prohibited a basement in the area. I've been haunted by that sickly sweet smell, that poisonous blend of citrus and pine, ever since that long ago birthday. When I saw my mother in the kitchen that day, collapsed in a pool of her own blood, I smelled it. When a man claiming to be my father knocked on my college apartment door, begged me for money, and beat me to within an inch of my life when I refused, I smelled it. When my wife miscarried our second child, I smelled it and again when she miscarried our fourth. When our oldest son got behind the wheel of the family Buick completely shit-faced and got his girlfriend killed, I smelled it. I began to smell it periodically as my wife became sick. She died late last year, and now I'm alone for the first time in more than half a century. Now I smell it every day, and it feels like an invitation. A few months ago I went back to the library, and the small oak door with the ancient handle was there right where it used to be. My evening walk has brought me past that library every day since, but I haven't gone inside. Maybe tonight I will. I'm frightened to die, yes, but lately I'm even more frightened to keep living. The old man was right. My road hasn't been easy, and I doubt it will get any easier. Rest your sorrows down, friend, and leave them where they lie. He promised relief. A refuge, he said. Was he right about that, too? There's only one way to find out. After all, I still know where to find him. That's a wrap for today on The Midnight Mystery. 
Hope you guys had as much fun as we did. If you liked what you saw, hit that subscribe button and give us a thumbs up. Oh, and don't be shy. Drop a comment below with your thoughts or any cool mystery ideas you want us to check out. Until next time, we'll see you in the next Midnight Mystery.